Good morning, church. My name is Lawrence Skinker. I'm the director of communications here at Cedar Crest. And our mission is to glorify the triune God by exalting him, edifying and equipping his church, and evangelizing the world with this gospel. If you're visiting us for the first time this morning, welcome. We hope you're edified by our, our singing, our prayer, and our preaching here at Cedar Crest. And if you're with us and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, we hope that uh, at the end of the service you'll make that decision today. Scripture says that today is the day of salvation. So if you don't know him, um, we hope that we invite you to come down after the service. There'll be prayer partners down the stage and you can do that. But regardless, if you're new, we invite you to fill out a connect card that's located on the pew rack in front of you. You can fill that out. It helps us get to know you, for you to get to know us. And after the service, you can drop that off at the Connect Center in the lobby, and uh, we have a gift for you, so please do that. We have an exciting roundup of different uh, events happening at Cedar Crest. One of those is Parents' Night Out. So parents who can enjoy a date night out on us, not me specifically, that would be disastrous, but our children's ministry. Um, Our children's ministry is putting on this event, and so they'll be taking care of childcare for you for children ages zero to, uh, to 12 years old, and they'll be doing that in the activity center. Uh, They say that, according to the website, they'll be transforming the activity center into a world of fun. So you don't want to miss out on that. And that's from 5.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Saturday, February 17th. So parents, you can go sign up for that online at cedarcrest.church. We also have our Child Dedication Sunday, which is approaching pretty quickly. That's on February 18th. It's a time in the service where we take... We take an opportunity to dedicate and entrust our little ones to the Lord. It's not a saving act. It's not baptism. It's just time in the service that parents can uh, dedicate uh, their children to the Lord and his sovereignty and providence in their lives. And so, again, that is February, Sunday, February 18th. And if you would like to sign up for that, you can also go to cedarcrest.church slash kids, and there's a form for you to, to fill out there. You do not have to be a member at Cedar Crest in order to, do, to take part in this, to participate. So even if you're not a member here, um, you can, you can uh, dedicate your child on Sunday, February 18th. And then in our men's ministry, we have our bi-monthly breakfast coming up. That is also on Saturday, February 17th. It's at, 7, it's at 7.30 a.m. in the activity center. The cost is $5.00. Uh, the guest speaker this time around is Pastor Keith Shrunk. Uh, he's from Saucon Community Church, a BFC church. And so men, you can go online to sign up for that at cedarcrest.church slash men or sign up at a promo table by the, uh, by the vision wall. So do that. It's a great time of uh, eating together, fellowshipping, worshiping, and uh, hearing from God's word. So we encourage you to do that. And fathers, uh, feel free to bring your sons to that. And then in our women's ministry, last but not least, the registration for the women's annual retreat is open. The deadline to sign up is February 25th, and the retreat dates are April 5th to the 7th, and it's the same venue as years past in Waymart, Pennsylvania. The theme this year is To Be Known, and that's based off of Psalm 8. And the guest speaker is Kimberly Kirk. She's an author and speaker whose passion is to equip women to know God more and live authentically for him. So the women have a nice promo table out there by the vision wall. You can sign up there or go online at cedarcrest.church slash women. And one final note, we believe here at Cedar Crest that giving is a form of worship that we want to steward uh, our resources well. And there are multiple ways that you can give here at Cedar Crest. One is online at cedarcrest.church slash give. But we also have an offering box in the back if you would like to uh, hand in uh, a payment in person. So you can do so in the back at our offering box. And uh, for all other events and information, you can refer to your bulletin uh, or go to our website, cedarcrest.church. And with that, I'll turn it over to Luke. Thank you, Lauren. Good morning. If you are able, I invite you to stand with us. I'm going to read to us a a text adapted from Colossians chapter 1. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He created all things, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Because of your faith in Christ and the hope held up for you in heaven, Christians, join to his throne and worship the king. Let's worship our king.
hope that's in the blood there's future grace that's mine today that jesus christ has won so i can face tomorrow for tomorrow's in your hands and all i Oh, 
take a moment to thank God and thank those who serve and lead us in corporate singing week in and week out. Not just people here, but also those of you who are not serving this. Can we just thank them? Thank you, guys. I know none of them want recognition because they want us to worship God, but the proverb says it's good to let another praise you. So we want to just be thankful and not take for granted the gift that God has given us with these dear servants. In listening to uh, the idea that um, the battle's already been won, that we're fighting a battle that's already been won, we know how the story ends. And then that day when we're freed from sinning, uh, when I was looking at that on the set list, my, my heart was drawn to read what that's going to look like for us in Revelation 21. So I want to read that before we pray together. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. 
The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Let's pray to this great God of mercy and justice and grace. Father, we thank you that we do indeed know how the story ends. Lord, we thank you that those of us in this room, by your grace and your grace alone, who are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, that that verse 8 is not our end, but that, Lord, you will right every wrong. You will bring justice. Every single thing that has ever been done against you or against others will be dealt with. And we praise you for that. That gives us hope and peace as we look at the world around us, literally in some ways burning. Lord, We are also grateful that you have dealt with our sin in your son, that you've not ignored our sin against you, but that you've put it on him, punished us in him, and satisfied all of your holy, righteous, infinite wrath against us in the person of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray this morning if there's anyone in this room that has not turned away from their sin, whether they be young or old, man or woman, poor or rich, popular or an outcast, that they would run to the only Savior of their souls this very day. God, work in their lives for your glory. Lord, I lift up this week to you our outreach a couple of the weeks, Stephen and Angelica Diaz. Lord, I thank you for their ministry at, at Lighthouse that they had for many years and now their new ministry at City Light in Allentown. Lord, I pray that you give them grace as they're ministering in a new context in Eastside. I pray that you give Steve grace, Lord, as he is still adjusting to this new role uh, as an associate to Pastor Rick. I pray that you would just give them grace as they raise their three boys. And I know, Lord, just meeting with Steve uh, each month with the other brothers that he is intentionally trying to disciple his son. So, Lord, give him grace as, as he does that, I pray. And, Lord, we do pray for our homebound of the week, Gordon Doyle, who can no longer gather with us as he would want to. Lord, give him grace in this season of life. May he, Lord, rest in you and seek comfort from you and strength from you. And may we, your people, continue to love on our brother. Lord, I pray for our college student of the week, Nathan Reimer. Thank you, Lord, for his recent marriage and just pray that you would bless he, he and, and uh, Lexi as they seek to love you and live for you and have their marriage be a picture of Christ and the church. I pray for Nate as he's seeking to be a testimony on his college campus and does ministry with disciple makers. Lord, just give our brother great grace to be faithful to you, faithful to his wife, and then faithful to the calling you've placed on his life. Lord, at this time we lift up two hurting families. We lift up to you the Haddinger family, Lord, and the loss of of Corey Gaiman's father. We just pray that you would give them grace as they are in mourning. We pray that you would sustain them through this, Lord, that you would do what you promise in James 1 and draw them closer to yourself and that they would, Lord, grow through this trial and that your people would surround them and love on them, both the Haddinger's church and us for Wyatt and Corey. And I, Lord, I lift up to you uh, Chuck and Sue Anderson as well, Lord, who lost their daughter-in-law this past weekend. Lord, give them great comfort and grace in this severe trial. I pray for their son that you would comfort him in this time that, Lord, you would be very near to them. We know that you are near to the brokenhearted and you bind up the crushed in spirit. Lord, would you do that? Would they cry out to you? Would they read the Psalms and meditate on those truths? And may this church family surround these dear people, Lord, and, and give them the comfort and be your hands and your feet. And sometimes, Lord, the best thing to do is just to sit with somebody as they're hurting. Give us grace to be faithful in that. Lord, I do pray for the preaching of your word. I ask you for... Jason, as he comes, that you would sustain him, Lord. Give him the words to say from a heart that has meditated on these truths and is genuinely proclaiming to us what he himself believes. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be hearers of the word and doers of the word. I pray that you would give us grace, Lord, to believe everything that you've said because you've said it. And Lord, we just thank you so much for the privilege it is to gather together. Lord, may we relish in this time and not be looking at our watches, but to be looking to you and what you want to feed us with. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We also want to mention that uh, every time we have Communion Sunday, it is a time to give towards the Deacon's Benevolence Fund, where they seek to meet the needs of those in our church and our community. And you can do that online or in the box in the back.
Kids, you're dismissed. Morning, everybody. May the Lord be with us. May he help me. I've been having TMJ issues, and I took medication this morning, and I'm feeling a little happy. (laughs) So if something comes out wrong, it's the medication. It's not of the Spirit, but the Lord's sovereign over that as well. This morning is an incredible passage. We're looking at Matthew chapter 9. If you have your Bibles with you, or you have your phone, please turn it on. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. And I want to tell you right away, this has been my prayer. All week long, in light of what Matthew has been telling us in his gospel, I've been praying, Father, please help us to see your Son for who he really is and to believe him to believe Him, and to take Him at His word. That is the crux of the issue for the people in the Bible and for us who read the Bible. Who is this man? Really, who is this man? In chapter 16, Jesus is going to ask His disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And think about this, gang. He has been doing miracles this whole time, and he has been claiming to be the anointed Christ of the Old Testament, and they're all dead wrong. Dead wrong. But then Jesus goes on to ask the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He got it. He got it. He saw him for who he really is. But he saw him for who he really is because the Father granted him sight. He didn't get to this conclusion on his own, through his own investigation or deduction. Jesus went on to say to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, He's the one. He's the one who has opened your spiritual eyes and mind and heart through the power of the Holy Spirit to see me for who I really am. Without that, nobody will see the kingdom of God. Nobody will see Jesus for who He really is. We need the Father's help and the Spirit's help. Gang, this is the difference between true salvation and knowing God or remaining lost and blind to who Jesus Christ really is. That's what we're going to see this morning in this account as Matthew builds his case over and over again that Jesus really is the promised Son of God who was to come into the world. You can hear Him screaming, look at the signs. Look at the signs. What are signs meant to do? Point you to the destination. He's it. You think of the sign of His genealogy, chapter 1. The Old Testament told us about this. That he was going to come from the line of David. His virgin birth as foretold in the Old Testament. His name Emmanuel as foretold in the Old Testament. His forerunner as foretold in the Old Testament. His temptations in the desert that he resisted and conquered where Israel failed in the Old Testament. Where he was going to minister as foretold in the Old Testament. Teach the Sermon on the Mount as he began to fulfill the Old Testament. And then heal the leper and the paralyzed as he fulfilled the Old Testament. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Isaiah 53, verse 4. And then calmed the wind and the waves just like the Old Testament said he would. This is what Matthew's trying to convey to his readers. That Jesus 
hear this, is the divine Messiah. He's the divine Messiah that the Old Testament has told us about. That He, just like the Old Testament would say, had the authority over the sin-cursed effects of the fall, like leprosy and paralysis, because He's the divine Messiah. That He would have the authority over the natural world, because He's the divine Messiah who made the world. That he would have the authority over the supernatural world, like we saw last week, because he is the divine Messiah who made them and keeps them on his leash. Do you see him? Do you see him? Jesus is the divine Messiah. Matthew has been laying out his credentials for the people to see that he's the one. Jesus does this for John the Baptist, who's going to question him in a moment of struggle and doubt in chapter 11. The Baptist sends his disciples to Jesus to ask him this question, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Jesus answered, go, Tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight as foretold in Isaiah 29 and 35. And the lame walk. Again, Isaiah 35 has said this. Lepers are cleansed just like Isaiah 53 said. The deaf hear. Isaiah 26 and 35. Again, the dead are raised up. Again, Isaiah 26, 29. The poor have the good news preached to them. Isaiah 61. <laughs> Let me read just a little bit of Isaiah 35 to you. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not, behold your God. He will come and say to you, the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the lame man shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. He's the one this is Matthew's point. I love that. Did you catch the, the beginning of that? Behold your God. Behold your God who does all these things. This is Matthew's point. Christ is God. And he's here in the flesh and he's doing all these things. And so now this morning, we're going to see Matthew make this case yet again with his eyewitness account of the Lord Jesus claiming to have an authority that only God himself has. And that is to forgive sin. Oh, this is making me have goosebumps. I believe this is the most important matter in the universe in two ways that I see. Number one, this proves without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is God. Number one. Number two, and this matters for you, Jesus Christ, because He's God in the flesh, has divine authority to forgive you all of your sins. That's precious. This is precious. Listen to me. No matter how you feel about your own self, or try to take authority into your own hands and forgive yourself if you've been counseled in that way. Christ is the only one you need to worry about and get forgiveness from. Jesus. But the question I'm going to ask you this morning as we dive into this text is this. Do you believe Him? Do you believe Him? Truly believe Him deep down in your bones. That he has the divine authority to forgive your sins. One theologian, I love what he said. He said this, more than all the others. All the others prove that he's deity. But this one for me, this really proves that he's God in the flesh. That he can forgive sins. Look at this divine authority. Verses 1 and 2, Matthew writes this. Getting into a boat, he crossed over. He came to his own city. Verse 2, and behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. 
What? I wrote down, whoa, baby. What a thing to say. It blew everybody away. But I got to set the stage first. Jesus just delivered the demoniacs. If you remember, the people wanted him to leave the region. Luke tells us he got into the boat, he left. Matthew picks this up and says he got into the boat, he crossed over. The sea is what he means. And he came to his own city that's not Nazareth where he grew up. This is Capernaum. This is where he set up shop. It was his home base of ministry. And I'm thinking he probably lived with Peter. In Mark's account of this, it says that Jesus was at home. Chapter 2, verse 1. We already saw Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law at the end of chapter 8. So they're probably back at Peter's house right now. And like Mark said, a report went out that he was back home, and you know what that means. The miracle worker, he's back. Let's go see him. And so Mark tells us that many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And you know what Jesus does when there's a crowd around? Mark says, he started preaching. I love Jesus. He just started preaching. He says he was preaching the word to them. And so you got a picture of this. Here he is, packed house, full of people, inside, outside. You couldn't even get in. You couldn't even get in the door. And so this is where Matthew he picks up the story. And yet he still leaves out a bunch of details. He really does. Mark tells us, because Mark got his information, you remember, right? from Peter. And so Matthew, if you read his account, he says, behold. Have you heard that before? Behold. He loves to use that word when he's about to tell you something awesome is going to happen. And man, does it ever. Behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Now Mark fills in a little bit. Chapter 2 of his gospel. It's he writes, they couldn't even get near Jesus because of the crowd. And so they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Could you imagine, gang, if that was your house? What was Peter thinking? What are you doing to my roof? <laughs> One historian said, now... It wouldn't have been that bad. It was common back in that day. I guess the houses were made out of sticks and, and thatch and mud and that kind of thing. And they would actually build, you've probably seen pictures of this in your Bibles, they would build a staircase on the outside of the house to go up on top of the roof to sleep up there when it got hot at nights. And so when the rain would come and it would just wash stuff away, they would redo their roof. And so these folks, they must have thought of that. Let's go up to the roof. Let's pull some of this stuff away so that we can lower our friend down to the Lord Jesus. There's way too many people down there. There's no way we are going to get to him. And could you imagine, put yourself in this story. You're sitting there, you're listening to Jesus, or you're standing around, and you start to feel stuff on your head. Right? They're peeling stuff away, and you start, and you're like, what in the world? And there's people tearing away the roof. <laughs> Here's the amazing thing about these people, and I would include the paralytic in this. They know this man has power. They believe that this man can heal the paralyzed friend. And so whatever it takes, we're going to get to him. We've got to tear a hole in the roof. We've got to tear a hole in the roof we got to get him to Jesus because we know that Jesus can heal him. This is what prompts Jesus' response in verse 2. Look at this. Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. Now, I'm thinking their faith includes the paralytic. I don't think it's just the friends that he's referring, that he's only referring to because of what he says to the paralytic. 
I'm probably right in saying that these folks heard the reports of the Lord Jesus Christ doing all kinds of miracles, healing all kinds of disease, including paralysis. And so they believe we get him to the Lord Jesus. He is going to heal him as well. And the Lord Jesus sees that as faith. Faith in him. In him. That I would say at this point is a desire to trust in Him and what He can do physically, I think, to begin with. I don't know if this man has full saving faith yet that totally understands who He is and that He came into the world to take away sin. I don't think He's there yet. But He believes that Jesus can heal His physical body. And I want to remind you of something. you got to remember the mind of a Jew. That sin is closely tied to your suffering. That's why Job's counselors said this to Job. Whoever perished being innocent. Or, you remember the disciples. When they asked about the blind man in John 9, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So what did the paralytic do to deserve this? That was in the mind of a lot of Jews. Maybe it's even in the mind of the paralytic. But remember what I taught you about sin back in chapter 8. That it can be a direct link to your suffering. Remember the example I gave to you, cirrhosis of the liver might be a result of drunkenness or it might not be a direct result of your sinful living. But the effects of living in a sin-cursed world can wreak havoc on us because sin was ushered in through Adam and Eve and we suffer from the effects of it, which means that not all suffering is a direct result of your sinning. Like in the case of Job, he was a righteous man. That's what God says, or the blind man. Do you remember Jesus' response to the disciples? It's not that he was born blind, or that he was born sinful, or he did any kind of sin, or his parents did any kind of sin that he was born blind. It's not because of that. It's for the glory of God. But again, in the Jewish mind, and sometimes in our minds, this is why we got to be careful when we diagnose They can go there right away. I'm thinking the scribes were probably thinking this. Sinner. Sinner. Now, the friends and the paralytic, I doubt they're thinking about all of this. Maybe they are. I don't know. They're they're thinking about their sin or the effects of the fall. I think they just want to get him there so that Jesus can heal him. (laughs) And typically, as we've seen, when people trust that Jesus can heal them physically, he does. He does. But what blows me away with what we're about to see is that Jesus is not going to deal with what Martin Lloyd-Jones, he's a doctor, so he would say this, he's not going to deal with the symptom this time. Jesus wants to get the disease. He wants to go deeper. He wants to take care of the problem that we all have. So look at how our Lord Jesus responds. Take heart. Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. This is an incredible statement. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins that you have committed against God are forgiven. And I have the authority to forgive you. That's the point of what Jesus said. He's saying here, and I love how he starts this. Look at his tenderness toward the paralytic. I'm telling you, in the Jewish mind, this is not what you would say to a paralytic who just interrupted your sermon. If this was a scribe or a Pharisee, they would have said, get him out of here. He's an unclean sinner. God has cursed you with a disease because you're a sinner, but not Jesus. Not our Lord Jesus. The first words that he says to the paralytic are, take heart. Take heart, my son. Literally, take courage. Don't be 
Don't be afraid. That's what I hear Jesus saying to him. Don't be afraid. I'm wondering if he was afraid. He heard reports about this man. This man claims to be the Son of God. This man is full of power. This man can heal anything. He could calm storms. Would you be afraid to stand before him? Don't be afraid. Take heart. Take courage. This is incredible. I think this would have been life-changing for this man. Take heart, he says, my son, my son. Now, at first I thought, Lord, is that a, is that a term of adoption like we know of adoption in the Bible when you save us and give us the right to become children of God? I don't think that's what it is here. That doctrine is absolutely true. What I think it is here, oftentimes they would say son when they would talk with a friend, a friend, Take heart, take courage. Don't be afraid, my friend. (laughs) Could you imagine? Just put yourself in that guy's shoes. And then, and then, to hear the most incredible words that anybody could ever hear in your life, Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Now, we all, we all sit here, we know our Bibles, it's been written for a couple thousand years, we can read, we know what the angel said, he came into the world to save sinners, what he said to Mary, he came to save his people from their sins, we know that, but yet here he is, the Son of God, face to face. Picture him speaking to you face to face. And he says, your sins are forgiven. I thought this was the only time he did this. He did it one other time with the woman who broke the flask of alabaster. The alabaster jar, do you remember that? Broke the ointment. Your sins are forgiven. <sighs> do you think he took heart? Do you think he took courage? My sins are forgiven. This is incredible. Now you've got to realize, he was not expecting this. His friends, they were not expecting Jesus to respond this way. Nor were the scribes. They just were not. They came to get healed. You notice, he didn't even ask. Right? You see him even speaking in the text? He didn't ask for his sins to be forgiven I wonder what's going through his head. I wonder if he's trying. Okay, is my disease connected to this or or what? But I tell you what, he's a Jew. He's a Jew. He would have known his Bible. He would have known that he was a guilty sinner. Sin has separated me from God's presence and friendship. I have rebelled. He knew the Ten Commandments by heart, gang. I think he would have had all kinds of verses just flying through his mind. You shall have no other gods before me. Man, I've worshipped other things. I've worshipped money. I've worshipped power. I've worshipped healthy people. Guilty. Honor your father and your mother. Man, I violated that when I didn't obey mom and dad. Guilty. Do not lie. Yeah, I've lied. Guilty. You shall not covet. I coveted healthy bodies, guilty. This man would have known his guilt, and he would have known what his guilt deserved from the Bible. Judgment. The soul that sins shall die, Ezekiel 18. So to hear these words from the Son of God would have made his heart sing. It would have made his heart sing and praise the God who removes our transgressions as far as the east is from the west. Psalm 103. Do you need to hear this this morning? His heart would have sung over the God who forgives sin and casts them into the depths of the sea. Micah 7, 19. This word forgive is a beautiful word. It means to send away, dismiss, leave behind, be pardoned of, forgiven of personal offenses of which you know this. There are many, whether it's lying or lusting or cheating or anger or slandering or gossip or jealousy or envy or love of money, on and on and on. And Jesus comes to this man and says, all forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. 
Take heart, my son. Take heart, my son. This is the greatest news in the universe for all of us, gang knowing that our sins are forgiven by the Son of God. I pray that you know this. I pray that you know this because the Bible says that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That the heart is wicked and deceitful above all else. That every thought and inclination of a man's heart is continually wicked. Jesus calls everyone evil. And out of the heart comes all of these evil things. This is why we do what we do. Whether it's ungodly anger. Anybody blow it this week? Don't lie, you got kids? <laughs> Lust, anybody battle? Did you ever disobey your mom and dad? We're all guilty. We're all guilty. We're all separated from God and we deserve God's wrath and judgment. And here, God the Father sends God the Son into the world and says, your sins are forgiven. This is incredible. Some of you really need to hear this today. Your sins are forgiven. I just wonder, I just wonder, when Jesus was saying this, to the paralytic. Man, oh man, was the cross flashing right before his mind? I'm going to take your sins, my son, every single one of them on the cross, and I'm going to pay for them. And I'm going to bear the wrath that you deserve for all of eternity in hell, and I'm going to take it upon myself on that cross. Was he tasting the wood when he said this? Your sins are forgiven. Do you need to hear this today from Jesus? Because if you've trusted in Him, you trust the cross, He says it to you, to you personally. Your sins are forgiven. Now maybe some of you came in here this morning and said, huh, maybe, maybe you've never darkened the door of a church, but you thought maybe, I, I don't know, my conscience is bothering me. I'm not such a good person. Maybe I'll get in the door without being struck by lightning. Let me tell you something. We're all in the same boat. Don't think that you have to clean up your act before you get to this place. Don't think you have to clean up your act before you come to Jesus. Listen to me. He already died for you 2,000 years ago. He didn't wait for you to live your life and say, hmm, I wonder if they're worth dying for. No, he went to the cross because he loves you. He took all of it, everything that you think, say, and do that is sinful and against God on himself 2,000 years ago without your input. That's love. Secondly, you need to take him at his word. You need to take him at his word. Word. Some of you need to hear that today. The main point of this entire text is that he has authority to forgive sins because he's God. And whatever God says is so. Now to get a feel for this earth-shattering comment from the Lord Jesus, especially to the Jews, <laughs> you got to remember that the Old Testament sanctuary is still in effect. Sacrifices are being made for your sins by the temple priest. But you're the one. You're the one who confessed your sins, knowing that only God can forgive your sin. Blessed is the man, if you knew your Old Testament, against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. It was the Lord who took away Isaiah's sin when Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord in Isaiah 6. David said to Nathan in 2 Samuel, I've sinned against the Lord with my adultery and murder. Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin and you shall not die. What's the point? The point is this. Only God can forgive sins. Only God. And the scribes, 
They even say this in Mark's account. And they're right. You know what that means? Jesus is claiming to be God. He's claiming to be God. So at this point in the story, we see the religious leaders, they're, they're reacting in complete shock at Jesus' statement because only God can forgive sins. And so now, I love this. Oh, Lord, is just awesome. He's going to prove it. He's going to prove that he's God and that he has authority to forgive sins. But the scribes, they don't believe it at all. Look at what they're saying, thinking in verse 3. Behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, this man's blaspheming. Now, we got a couple of questions to answer. Who are the scribes? Why are they there? Why are they accusing the Lord Jesus of blasphemy? And what is blasphemy? So the scribes, they're similar to the Pharisees, not exactly the same, but they're the experts in the Old Testament law. But the Pharisees were also there, according to Mark. The Pharisees, they were the religious leaders of the day. They carried out the Old Testament law, the traditional laws in the temple and they all considered themselves to be the experts. So if you're going to talk about forgiveness, or you've got a question about the Bible, or a question about forgiveness, you ask them. The next question is, why are they there? They're there because Jesus has been drawing crowds. Jesus is teaching with authority. Jesus is doing incredible miracles. And he's taking their people And so you better believe it. They are checking him out. And gang, this is the first time we see them opposing Jesus in Matthew's gospel. But take a look at the text privately. Privately. Look what he says. They were saying this to themselves because they're not speaking out yet. They're not out with it. They're not coming against him. Mark says they were questioning in their hearts why Jesus was saying this. They said to themselves, why does this man speak like this? Son, your sins are forgiven. Boy, that, that caught their attention. You better believe their ears perked up. Who is this heretic? This is just a man, and only God can forgive sins I'm surprised they didn't tear their robes, cry blasphemy. They will later. But here's the question. Is their accusation true? Is it true? Did Jesus commit blasphemy when he said this? Here's a man who has demonstrated he has all authority. He has all authority. He taught as one with authority. He has authority over paralysis. He has authority over leprosy. He has authority over nature. He has authority over the supernatural things in the world. So C.S. Lewis was absolutely right when he came up with his trilemma. you got to deal with this man. He's either a liar or a lunatic or the Lord. He's a liar to claim these things. He's either a lunatic to claim he's God when he's not, or he is the Lord. I believe he's the Lord. Jesus, he's going to answer. He's, he's, I love this. He's going to turn the tables on them. He's going to prove. He's going to prove that they're committing blasphemy against him and against God. Proving that he has divine authority. In verse 4, I love this. They, he knows their thoughts. Do you find that scary? Could you imagine? You're with a man who knows your every thought, can read your mind. I know what's in your heart. I know what you're thinking. Oh, my word. That's divine But he goes right to the core of their evilness. He says to them, why do you think evil in your hearts? You don't believe me. That's evil in the Lord's eyes. You're questioning my divine authority. You're questioning that I'm the anointed one. You're questioning the fact that I am the king of the Jews. And so now... He's going to prove that he's God in the flesh, that he has authority to forgive sins, which, gang, you cannot see, right, with your physical eyes. You can't see this being done on the outside. So what's he going to do? He's going to prove that it happened by doing an incredible miracle on the outside that you can see. (laughs) I love this. 
He's just basically saying, I, I do this, then I have authority to do this. I can't do this, and I don't have authority to do this. Look at this question. I thought it was a brilliant question, verse 5. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? You know what that means. It's easier just to say the words. Your sins are forgiven. Nobody can verify if this is true or not, or if this actually happened on the outside. Anybody can just mouth the words. Nobody knows if it's true. means it's far easier to say that your sins are forgiven than to say to this paralyzed man, rise and walk. That's something on the outside that everybody can see and verify. So here, doing is a lot harder than just saying. Now, we all know at a deeper spiritual theological level that the greatest thing in all the universe is God to forgive sins. But he's making a point. He's making a point. He's going to prove the one by doing something else. He's going to demonstrate that he has authority to forgive sins by healing a man's body. Look at what he says. And then what he does in verses 6 and 7. That you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose. (laughs) He rose and went home. I would have been snarky. Now what do you say? Now you know, now you know Son of Man has authority to forgive sins that you can't see and prove, but I just proved to you that I have that authority because I've also shown you divine authority to heal a man with just a word. Love this. Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. He rose and went home. This paralyzed, you know what paralysis is for you young kids that are in here? He couldn't move a muscle. Everybody knew this. And the guy stood up and walked home. Behold your God. I want you to notice very carefully the title and the words that our Lord uses in this phrase. Listen carefully. That you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth. To forgive sins. You know what it says to me? He's not from around here. He's from heaven. He's not ultimately from the earth. Why? Because he's the son of God. And then he uses the title son of man. Not son of God, but son of man. Now, that can mean he's just a man in the Bible. But it also means he's the divine Messiah of Daniel chapter 7. Listen to these words. Daniel seeing a vision, saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom will never be destroyed. This is not a mere man. This is a divine man. Coming on the clouds of heaven, given dominion, glory. That's only reserved for God. Just like the authority to forgive sins is only reserved for God alone. And the Son of Man is given these divine traits. And here he is. Can you imagine? Here he is. This is the Son of Man, the one in Daniel, standing right in front of you. This is incredible. He's divine. Of course, they don't believe it. Nor will they believe it at the end of Matthew's gospel. Do you remember when he's on trial and they ask him, Are you the Christ? Are you the Christ? Jesus says, You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. (laughs) Daniel 7. Guess what the high priest did? Blasphemy! Tore his robes. It's not blasphemy. Because he is the divine Messiah. He is. And so, how do the people respond? We've got a little bit of time. Touch on this. Verse 8. The crowd saw it. They were afraid. And they glorified God who had given such authority to men. The word for afraid is awe. They were in awe. Now, I don't think these crowds 
I don't think they're there yet. I don't think they understand quite fully who the Lord Jesus Christ is. I doubt this included the scribes and the Pharisees. Do you? Maybe Nicodemus is in the crowd. He's going to go ask Jesus later, maybe. But the people are in awe. And one man, he did a study of the word awe and afraid, and it shows up after Jesus does a lot of stuff. The disciples were in awe when he calmed the storms. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, the man who was born, looks just like us, is God in the flesh. It's God from above. It's God from heaven. He has come. He has come. He has come. And He has dwelt among us. And He really did come and take away the sins of the world. He was proving a point in this text, but he was also saving one of his sheep that he came to save. And he said to him personally, your sins are forgiven. Do you need to hear that from the Lord Jesus this morning? Do you need to believe it? I'm going to share a story with you that early on in my walk, I was very performance driven. I had a hard time basing my standing before God solely on the justification of Christ alone. It was all about my faith and my performance. And I had one man come up to me. It felt like a slap in the face, but man, did I need it. He said, are you telling me that Jesus' death on the cross wasn't good enough for you? You have to atone a little bit more for your own sins? Oh, secondly, who do you think you are? Are you God? Do you think you're God because you've got to forgive yourself? You're taking authority that you do not have. You're not submitting to the king of the universe who says your sins are forgiven. And we sang it earlier. It's finished. It's finished. Do you believe that? Some of you might be wrestling with that this morning. Do you believe him when he says it is so? It is so. I was listening to Tony Evans. I just turned him on the radio this past week. He was talking about how true the Bible is, and when it says the word indeed, he says translation, show enough. Sure enough. It's sure enough, gang. This word is true. Father, we come before you. Thank you for this word. Thank you. Lord Jesus, you have the divine authority over all things. You are King of kings, Lord of lords, you are the Son of God, the Son of man, who has authority on earth to forgive sins. You have that authority because you came and you went to the cross to take our sins upon yourself, Lord. You offered your very self up on on the altar as we're about to partake this morning and remind ourselves that the work is done, that you took every sin that we've ever committed upon yourself, and you paid the price. We thank you for that. Bless us now as we partake of communion. Help anybody, any of my dear friends in here, first unbelievers, if they don't truly know you, that you would convert them, Lord. Open their eyes to who Jesus really is and what he's done. Secondly, if there's believers in the room that just wrestle and battle with their assurance, help us to believe. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Before we take communion, we're going to sing and behold this Jesus. So I invite you to stand with us. Who is held? in his hands who has numbered every grain of sand kings and nations tremble at his voice all creation rises to rejoice Come 
seated as we receive communion. Take two. As the brothers are passing out the elements, turn me on. Okay. <laughs> I want to read to you from Luke's account of our wonderful Savior that we just read about, who is incredible. This is the other account when he says personally, your sins are forgiven. I don't know what brought you in here this morning. 
If you've been a believer for a long time, or if this is your first time, and your conscience is just riddled with guilt, shame, listen to this account. I'm sure this woman felt the same thing. One of the Pharisees, this is a religious leader, asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house, and he reclined at table. Behold, I guess Luke likes that word too. A woman of the city who was a sinner when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house brought an alabaster flask of ointment. Standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, wiped them with her, the hair of her head, kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know. What sort of woman this is who's touching him, for she's a sinner. Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He answered, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You've judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She has wet my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. He who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Amen. Hallelujah. That's what we're celebrating here at the table. The fact that we can be forgiven of our sins. The reason Jesus could say that our sins are forgiven is, yes, number one, He has divine authority as God to forgive sins, but number two, He knows what's coming. He knows, according to the Old Testament, that without blood there's no forgiveness, that the soul who sins shall die. He knows that humanity will perish forever and pay for their sins in eternal hell if He doesn't go to the cross and take their sins, our sins, upon Himself and bear the punishment in our place. That's why we come to the table He said these words to his disciples in Matthew. As they were eating, Jesus took bread. After blessing it, broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink all of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Hallelujah. God, God of heaven and earth, the one who made it all, became a man, flesh and blood, dwelt among us so that he could go to the cross He came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the foremost, the Apostle Paul would say. And we could all say that very same thing along with him, with all the things that we have done and committed against God. And yet Jesus said, I've done it. I went to the cross. I took it. Whatever sins bothered you this morning, I took it. I took it. I paid for it on the cross. Stop atoning for your own sins. Stop whipping yourself. I bore it. I bore it. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. Now that's for a believer. And that's why we observe the Lord's table every month to remind ourselves of what our Master did for us 
at the cross. And so we want to think deeply on this. We want to meditate on the fact of what he's done. And we want to be encouraged. We want to take heart that he did this for us. Our God loved us that much that he would lay down his life for us. That's for the believer. If there's anybody in here that doesn't know Christ in that way, I'm imploring you. I'm imploring you to turn to him, to turn from the world, to follow him, to repent of your sin, turn away from your love of it, Turn to Him. Run to Him. Call on His name to be saved. Trust that He died for your sins. If you do that, if you do that, you can partake of the Lord's Supper with wonderful assurance that He has forgiven you. But if you're not, I want you to set the blood and the bread aside and I want you to look at it and stare at it. Because those things are a reminder of what the Lord Jesus went through and did to pay the price for our sins. And if you're not a believer, you're not supposed to partake of that. The Apostle Paul said in chapter 11, he said, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. In the same way, also, he took the cup. He took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. And I love these these parting words from Paul. As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together, then you're dismissed. Father, we come before you. Thank you for forgiveness. To think that we could be forgiven against the one whom we have committed cosmic treason against. Our creator, who is holy, 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 without sin in your presence, Without sin in your mind, without sin in heaven, you are absolutely perfect and righteous. And we have rebelled, we have sinned, we have gone our own way, we've rejected, we've loved darkness rather than light, death rather than life. And to think that you would have mercy on your creatures who thumb their nose at you, to send your one and only Son, you, Lord Jesus, and be willing to take on flesh and blood and to come to this earth to dwell among us. And even then you were rejected, opposed, like we saw this morning, even after giving sign after sign after sign. Oh, how thankful we are that you, Father, opened our eyes to see Jesus for who he really is. Without you, we would have never ever seen him, believed in him, come to him, cried out to him for salvation. Thank you for doing that work. And thank you, Jesus, for coming and being willing to die for sinners, to take the wrath that we deserve for all of eternity. All of eternity never ends. And you took it all away. Our sins and God's wrath He gave us the Spirit, and He gave us eternal life where we will be with you forever and ever and ever. Lord, bless my dear friends, brothers and sisters. Help them all to walk out of here knowing that if they've trusted in your name, they've trusted in your work, help them to believe it when you say to them, Son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. And all of God's people said, Amen. Love you. See you next week.
Hi, my name is Pastor Jason Hoy. We're so glad you found us and watched the service online today. If you have any questions about the sermon or the church in general, please visit our website at cedarcrest.church or email info at cedarcrest.church. We would love to see you in person and get to know you better. Our services are every Sunday at 10 a.m. God bless.